The school maintenance staff are busy people. They work hard to maintain a safe, clean, and attractive environment. One very important job is pest control. And the best way to do that job is with IPM, Integrated Pest Management, an environmentally sensitive approach. IPM uses all suitable control tactics, both chemical and non-chemical, to minimize risks to people and the environment by controlling pests. To help you learn more about IPM, you'll see how to perform an actual IPM service inside a school building. Integrated pest management has four basic steps. Inspection and identification of the problem, taking action, and evaluating your progress. Let's look first at the inspection. Before taking any pest control action, an IPM specialist always conducts an inspection to look for two things, unsanitary conditions and evidence of the pests themselves. Unsanitary conditions are more than just dirty dishes. From an IPM standpoint, sanitation problems occur when a pest can find all the things it needs to live. Harborage, that is, a hiding place, food, and water. IPM inspectors look for correctable sanitation conditions, like leaky pipes, unsealed cracks, gaps under doors, and many other things. You can fix some correctable conditions on the spot. Take note of others for later action. Inspections require proper tools and a sharp eye. There are five tools that are essential. A good flashlight, a mirror, a screwdriver, a flushing agent, and a clipboard. This is probably the most important inspection tool. It allows you to see into dark areas and corners where pests hide. A mirror helps you to see under and behind equipment and into places that are out of view. Mirrors like this are versatile and tough. A standard screwdriver, or even better, an electric screwdriver, makes it easy to open equipment and electric panels, places where pests hide. Aerosol and dust flushing agents like pyrethrum and resmethrin are special chemicals that are very irritating to pests. When sprayed into pest harborages, these chemicals flush pests into the open where you can see them. A clipboard is a must for writing down what you find during an inspection. Don't rely on your memory. A skilled inspector keeps a good record of problems and pests as they are discovered. Once you find evidence of pests, the second step in the IPM process is pest identification. Developing identification skills takes training and experience. Because some control methods affect only certain pests, you must be able to identify pests accurately. There are a number of excellent identification guides and reference books for pest control professionals. Your Cooperative Extension Service and local state university can also assist. The third step of an IPM service is action. Before you take action, though, you should have a plan. Prepare the plan by listing potential pest problems. Then outline all the control methods or tactics that could help solve each problem. The last step in conducting an IPM service is evaluation, based on your inspection findings. In other words, what can you do to improve the IPM program and make it more effective? Putting IPM to work is an ongoing dynamic process. 
Inspection, identification, action, evaluation. You never really finish. You just repeat these steps every time the school is serviced. This is a typical classroom. Lots of opportunities for pests. Insects are attracted to sinks and plumbing areas. Add an open bag of pet food and you've got it. Instant pest home. Focus your classroom inspection on dark corners of cabinets and under sinks. Note potential problems like unsealed food stored near water sources. Also, monitor rooms for crawling insects. Use sticky traps, the kind made of stiff paper with a special adhesive on one side to catch insects. Beware though, these traps can be a curiosity to children, so place them where they can't be reached or use them during times when the students are gone. Because most insects prefer to travel along edges, put traps against walls or in corners close to suspected hiding places. Ants are commonly found on classroom countertops and around trash cans and desks. Indoor ant problems usually begin outdoors, so check window and door seals carefully. When ants persist, discourage the practice of storing or eating food in the classroom, at least until the ant nest can be detected and treated. Still, Food, and especially candy, should always be sealed in airtight containers. Fungus gnats are tiny flies that breed in potting soil. They are common in houseplants. To identify an infested pot, attach a small yellow or blue sticky card. Gnats are attracted to the card's color. If you find the plant is infested, take it away from the school to treat it with an appropriate pesticide or biological control. Return sprayed plants only after they have thoroughly dried. Break rooms and vending machines are also pest-prone places. Spilled drinks, crumbs, and trash are great pest foods. Besides water areas, look for pests where it's warm, like around vending machines and coffee pots, even electric clocks. It's surprising how few people associate good sanitation with pest control. To help teach faculty and staff about their part in IPM, Consider posting an eye-catching flyer or other reminder in the break room. Finally, empty all trash cans and recycle containers regularly. Soda cans with dried syrup make nice feeding troughs for roaches and ants. Keep recycling bins well away from water sources. Remember the three things roaches need to thrive? Food, water, and harborage? Eliminate just one, and you've taken a big step toward eliminating a potential roach problem. One of the biggest problems with utility areas is getting keys and authorization to enter. But it's worth the extra effort to gain access. Just one overlooked pest harborage can create problems for an entire school. Rodents, cockroaches, and silverfish are common pests in utility areas because of the humidity and warmth. Keeping utility areas clean and well organized helps reduce pest harborage and makes inspection easier. Even though utility areas are often locked, rodent traps and bait stations should still be covered and clearly marked. Outdoors, landscaping practices around a school building can contribute to pest problems. Heavy ground covers and mulches harbor many pests. Look for unsealed gaps and holes in buildings. Such openings provide entry for unwelcome guests like birds, rodents, bees, and wasps. Even small cracks may shelter ants and crawling arthropods. Outdoor lighting is important for security, but bright lights also attract insects. Insect problems can often be traced to outdoor lights that draw hordes of nighttime flying insects. Those are some of the things to look for during the inspection phase of the IPM process. Now I'm going to help you with the second phase, identification. One of the most widespread pests is the German cockroach. German cockroaches are one of several species of cockroaches that can infest buildings. They are light brown and small, about one-half to five-eighths inch long. Like other roaches, they prefer darkness, so chances are the problem is pretty serious if you see them during the day. Cockroaches spend most of their time in cracks and tight corners. If you can insert the tip of a pencil into a crack, it's large enough for a cockroach. Look for signs such as fecal spots, egg cases, or oothica, or the cockroaches themselves. 
A chemical flushing agent temporarily drives cockroaches from hiding places so that you can identify the active harborages. A dozen or more species of ants may inhabit a school, but most of them share similar behaviors, like trailing. When a foraging ant finds food or water, it leaves a special scent behind to show the way for other ants. By following a trail of ants, you might find their nest or the opening that's letting them in. House mice are the most common rodent problem in schools. These mice are small, about two and a half to three and a half inches long. Fecal droppings are usually the first sign of an infestation. The droppings are one eighth to one fourth inch long and rod shaped with pointed ends. Chewing marks on wood or chewed holes in food packages are another sign of mice. To find where the mice are most active, spread a non-toxic tracking powder like flour or talcum close to walls. Then place traps and sticky boards where you see the most tracks. Termites attack wood of all types, including structural wood and flooring, and are one of the most expensive pests to deal with. Termite reproductives, sometimes called swarmers, are generally dark brown or black and have straight bodies rather than a pinched waist like ants. The termites you collect may or may not have wings. The wings will be equal in length and slightly longer than the body. Termite workers are creamy white with a slightly darker head. Subterranean termites are the most common. These insects live in soil but construct thin dirt tubes to reach wood that is above ground. Avoid placing wood in direct contact with soil and clear away soil that piles up against siding or ventilated holes in brick facings. These conditions help termites find their way into buildings. Besides German cockroaches, several larger cockroach species may become a problem. These include the smoky brown, oriental, and American types. American and oriental cockroaches like to live in sewer systems, storm drains, and utility areas. However, they also exist outdoors, along with the smoky brown cockroaches. These pests make their homes in leaf litter, stones, hollow trees and palm trees, mulches and other ground cover, not to mention water meter boxes, sewer access holes, and even building soffits and overhangs, especially if the roofs are leaky. Let's not forget rats. There are two important rat species, the roof rat and the Norway rat. Roof rats are the smaller of the two, having a sleeker body but a longer tail. As the name implies, roof rats are good climbers. They like to nest in trees and attics, while Norway rats prefer to burrow in the ground, often under concrete slabs and piles of debris. Both rats are active mostly at night. Rats eat almost any food and tend to follow the same path to food and water every day. Well-used pathways would be clear of cobwebs and debris and may show dark smudge stains from contact with oily rat fur. To see if rats are using an opening, simply block the entrance with a movable object. The rats have been there if the object has been displaced by your next inspection. Wasp and bee nest require quick action. These insects are a danger to children and adults who are allergic to insect venoms. Be careful when approaching a nest. Honey bees, paper wasps, yellow jackets, and hornets are social insects that may attack when their nest is disturbed. It's helpful to know whether these stinging insects have nests made of wax or paper. Nests made of mud belong to wasps that sting very rarely. Now that we've learned to identify some common school pests, let's talk about the next phase of IPM, taking action. There are two types of action, short-term corrective or long-term preventive. Short-term control methods may correct the problem quickly, but only temporarily. Long-term control methods may require more expense and effort, but the results are usually worth it. Short-term control actions include the application of pesticides, but they may also include the use of many non-chemical methods, such as traps, vacuums, and biological controls. Light traps, for example, take advantage of the attraction that many insects have to light. Indoor light traps can greatly reduce fly populations, but proper installation is critical. Never place the trap in a doorway or where outdoor insects can see it and be drawn to it. Most indoor fly traps use sticky boards to catch flies. This eliminates the undesirable electrical noise of an electrocutor type trap. In general, place fly traps at or below eye level, the zone in which flies usually travel. 
Vacuums are great for certain pests like cockroaches, particularly for quick reduction of heavy infestations. Special vacuums with filters are made for pest control work, but even a standard portable vacuum can be used. Glue boards and snap traps for mice and rats are still good ways to quickly control these rodents, especially for light and moderate infestations. They work better when baited with peanut butter, fruit, meats, nuts, or cereal. For mice, traps should be spaced no further than 15 feet apart. Rat traps and bait stations should be spaced no further than every 20 to 30 feet along rat runways. Be sure to check traps and boards daily to avoid smells and other problems. Multiple catch traps like this are spring-loaded and can catch dozens of mice in a single setting. Check these traps at least weekly. Rodent traps should be placed at a 90 degree angle across known or likely pathways. You also may position snap traps end to end. Another alternative to pesticides is biological control, a way to take advantage of organisms that are natural enemies of pests. For example, beneficial mites can be used to control some indoor plant pests. Special fungi are even used to help control German cockroaches in some kitchens. Biological pest control is still relatively limited, but holds promise for the future. Chemical control methods do play an important part in integrated pest management. However, always use pesticides sparingly and with caution. Some states require a license to apply pesticides in schools. So, before using any pesticide, become thoroughly familiar with your state's pesticide laws and regulations. Fortunately, many of today's pesticides are designed with safety in mind. Containerized baits like these are a good example. Because pests readily eat the bait inside, much less insecticide is needed. Carefully placed bait stations can eliminate the need for spray treatments, which are more hazardous. Baits also come in aerosol, dust, gel, and paste forms. In some situations, an indoor pesticide spray may be needed for a spot treatment. Broader spraying, known as broadcast application, should rarely be used indoors. The practice of spraying walls, floors, and baseboard is seldom effective and should be avoided in schools. Broadcast applications are used more commonly outdoors on shrubs or turf grass or around the foundations of school buildings. Spot sprays are defined as a treatment limited to an area no larger than two feet by two feet, such as the space behind a piece of equipment or around a floor drain. The most precise type of pesticide spraying is called directed placement. Directed placements are used to reach inaccessible cracks and spaces called voids. This type of application is very useful indoors because it reaches pests where they live and move. Now let's consider the actions you can take for long-term and even permanent pest control. These actions involve using a variety of materials to pest-proof your school buildings. Cover roof vents, windows, doors, and other openings with metal hardware cloth or screen. Make sure the mesh size is small enough to block the pests you want to keep out. Make sure outside doors fit well and are constructed from metal or glass. Check that door sweeps are properly installed to keep out pests. Reduce cockroach harborages with caulks, foam, and mortar. Use caulk to seal cracks and small holes but use expanding foams and mortar to close larger openings. Where rats and flies are a problem, poorly sealed dumpsters may be the cause. Move trash away from buildings and ask your local waste contractor about special pest-proof dumpsters. Modify landscaping to discourage pests from entering buildings. Replace heavy ground covers such as ivy where cockroaches are a problem. With these actions, you've completed the first three steps in the IPM process. Inspection, identification, and taking action. But if you stop there, you miss an important chance to keep improving your IPM program. The fourth and last step in the integrated pest management program is evaluation. When we evaluate, we review the data and observations we've collected and ask, what can we do better? Of course, to take this look back, you need a good record-keeping system. A pest control file should include service report forms, contract specifications, if outside contractors are used, property diagrams, 
and labels of all the pesticides used in the school, along with their accompanying material safety data sheets. It's important to keep this information easily accessible for anyone who wants to review it. It's also a good idea to keep a pest control complaint log where staff can record problems or complaints. Many schools find that a bulletin board in a central office area is a good place for posting the complaint log. The IPM inspector should review the log as well as check in with a responsible site manager during each visit to a school. It's also a good idea to meet with the district maintenance head at least once a year to review the progress of your IPM program. Some of the questions to ask at these meetings might include, what can be done to improve the pest situation in the future? Have insect breeding sites been overlooked? Are certain treatments not working? How can sanitation be improved? Have correctable conditions been fixed? Are more monitoring stations needed? Are communication channels effective? How can they be improved? How can education of school staff regarding IPM, sanitation, and their individual roles in it be improved? It's not an easy job, but with an IPM approach, it's a very manageable one. In the long run, you'll be providing a better place to work and learn. IPM is a multifaceted approach to pest control. When everyone does their part, and good sanitation and proper building maintenance are enforced, our schools become better environments and safer places for our children.